The stench hit them at the same time as the sound of splintering wood. They'd been hints of it as they'd first peered and then shouted through the letterbox, but they'd not discussed its obvious implication. It could just have been old man smell. We should leave this to the police. Dave took a step back to the path as he spoke. Graham saw him reaching behind to open the low gate. That's hardly neighbourly, Graham countered. But he wouldn't want strangers finding him. So what are we? Dave had a point. Neighbours were all they were, nothing closer. Dave on one side and Graham on the other. Graham took a step forward into the hallway. It was too late now to draw back from what they'd chosen to do. He tried to breathe through his mouth, but he was still aware of the miasma that hung in the air and its cause. He sent Dave at his shoulder, ever happier to follow than to lead. There was only a few steps to the doorway on the left that Graham knew would lead to the front room. The door was ajar and the sound of the television, not turned up too loud, filtered out to them. It was a familiar voice, but it took Graham a moment to place it. David Attenborough, evidently a wildlife documentary. He's watching telly. Dave's voice came from closer than Graham had expected. He must be okay after all. Graham wasn't so optimistic. Ben, he called out in something slightly less than a shout. The only response was Attenborough's hushed, awed whisper. Ben, Graham repeated louder this time. Still, there was no genuine reply. They're at the door now. Graham pushed it fully open and they looked into the room. The television was in the corner near the bay. On the screen, a pair of brightly coloured parrots were flourishing their plumage and dipping their heads towards each other. An armchair faced the screen, its back to the door. The top of the old man's head was just visible. There was a tiny ball patch on its crown, but other than that, he kept his hair. It was grey now, almost white, and long and unkempt. It was one of Graham's clearest memories of Ben from years ago, his neat, short back and sides. Even in the 70s, when Graham had first come here, he couldn't recall Ben's hair ever touching his collar. A haircut you could set your watch to, his grandfather recalled it. The only other part of the man that was visible was the sleeve of his jacket, resting on the left arm of the chair. Protruding from the end of it, Graham could just make out the flesh of his hand, though it wasn't the colour of flesh. He risked a brief sniff of the air. The smell was stronger here. Both men edged across the room, following a curve at the centre of which sat Ben in his chair. Once they could see his face, there was no doubt. The eyes were gone, that was the first thing Graham noticed. He knew nothing of the signs, but it seemed reasonable that such soft organs would be the quickest to decay. Around the black, gaping sockets, the skin was dark and leathery, drawn in at the cheeks as though the man hadn't eaten for weeks. It must have been weeks at the very least. No one quite remembered when they'd last seen Ben. Those that even recognised the name. It could have been two months or even more. He heard Dave's voice and turned to see him speaking into his mobile. I don't know. Ambulance, I suppose. Police, too. There was a pause and Dave glanced over, an expression of half-apology on his face. But he was right. Graham had been right that it should be they who came in to find him. But now there was nothing more they could do. Dave began to speak again. It's an old man, a neighbour. He's dead. Absolutely. Weeks, maybe months. Yes, it's David Russell. Oh, his name. That's Ben. He looked at Graham, who could only shrug. I don't know his surname, I'm afraid. Dave continued. Yeah, sure. We're at 52. Graham walked out into the hallway and tried to breathe. He didn't need to hear the conversation. He was glad it was Dave making the call, not him. He glanced around the house. Towards the rear, a door led up to the kitchen. To one side of the corridor, stairs led up to the first floor. There were small houses, which is why most of them had been extended in some way, either by building into the garden or converting the loft or both. Ben's was one of the few that remained in its original form. There'd been no need for more room. Ben had no family, not the Graham knew of. He'd been friendly enough with his neighbours, but had never invited any of them in. Didn't socialise. Didn't like parties. Graham stopped himself. How did he know that? It was a distant memory, 40 years old. Back then, Graham had often stayed with his grandparents next door at number 50. His granddad and Ben used to chat over the low wall that divided the properties, discussing their gardens and always insisting that the other had the lusher, greener lawn. And then one time, his grandparents had thrown a party. Fancy dress. They'd asked Ben, but he hadn't shown up. Graham remembered his grandfather being disappointed. And that was when he'd mentioned Ben not liking parties. Graham had had a single, quiet chuckle. It was strange how some recollections could be so vivid. Back then, Ben had seemed such a square to a five-year-old like Graham. Off to work every day in his suit and bowler hat. Worked in the city, probably. In the days before computers, when dozens like Ben, dressed the same and thinking the same, would go through the numbers by hand, adding up long columns in vast ledgers, 
with perhaps only the aid of a clunking mechanical calculator. But now Graham saw it differently. He worked in the city himself, although the PC under his desk had the calculating power of a million bends, and the city had moved a mile or so downstream. Dull sometimes, but it supported Graham and the family more than comfortably. But Ben had had no family. They'll be here soon. Dave seemed to appear from nowhere, stepping through the door from the sitting room. Soon? It didn't sound like they were going to rush. Graham nodded, but said nothing. I suppose we should wait outside, Dave continued. Graham turned his head towards the front door, still open, light streaming through it from the road outside. The promise of fresh air was tempting, but he resisted. No, he said. We've come this far. It wouldn't do to leave him on his own now. He stepped back into the room where Ben was sitting, and Dave followed him. They both looked at the body. Ben was still wearing his dark suit. Could even be the same one Graham remembered from decades before, but it was more likely to be an indistinguishable replacement. Ben wasn't a man who liked change. In death, he was dressed just as Graham remembered him being for the last ten years, a failed attempt to maintain the punctilious neatness of his younger days. The trousers didn't even match the suit, but instead were pinstriped, thin white lines running down their length, similar to the pattern of his tie. Anyone seeing him as he strolled and in late years tottered along the pavement might have thought that he'd only half changed out of his pyjamas, but they were real outdoor trousers. It was obvious to anyone who got close. Under the jacket was a familiar green tank top. How Graham knew it was a tank top and not a jumper without being able to see the arms, he was not sure, but he was certain that it was. Dave took a step across the room and turned off the television. The programme had changed and the last images before the screen blanked were of animals in a zoo. We should try putting you in a cage, see if you like it. Graham could hear Ben's voice shouting at the kids on the street. One of them had brought his pet rabbit out front to show his friends, but the hutch he had put it in was horribly small, scarcely big enough for the creature to turn round. It was probably only temporary, but Ben had taken against it and shouted and the children had run off, scared away by the roving old man. It was typical of Ben, always standing up for the underdog. If the children had been mistreated, he'd have stood up for them, but in this case it was the rabbit and so that was where Ben's sympathies lay. It wasn't an attitude that would go down well in the city today, and Graham doubted if things would have been that much different in the 70s. What's that? asked Dave, pointing towards Ben's corpse. What? There, in his hand. Graham took a deep breath through his mouth and stepped closer, bending forward so as to see better, but fearful of getting too near, as if Ben's death might be somehow infectious. His right hand was clutched around something. It was oblong, a box of some kind. Too big to be cigarettes or playing cards. Graham reached forward. No, hissed Dave, but Graham ignored him. He grasped the end of the box, using his thumb and index finger like pincers, desperately careful not to make contact with Ben's rotting skin. He pulled, but the hand seemed to resist, eager to keep hold of its possession even in death. With his free hand, Graham reached into his pocket and pulled out a biro, pressing it against Ben's knuckle without having to touch it himself, like he'd seen detectives do on TV. Still, Ben would not release his trophy. Graham pulled a little harder, almost cringing in anticipation that what ultimately did yield would be the hand itself. He saw the image of Ben's fingers still curled around the box, but no longer attached to their owner. It took no great exertion of force, and with the slightest sound of fingertips peeling away from cardboard, the box became free. Graham held it more firmly in the rough sensation of sandpaper along one side, immediately revealed its nature. It's a matchbox, he announced. Dave took a step towards him and peered. Cook's matches? Graham nodded. That made sense, judging by the size of the box, bigger than his hand. He glanced around, but there was nothing in the room to light. The grate of the fire was empty. It was quite warm enough at this time of year. There were no candles nor cigarettes. Graham had never seen Ben smoke. Even if he had done, Graham could only picture it as being a pipe, and there was no sign of anything like that either. He pushed at one end and the box slid open, delivering a small pile of pink-tipped matchsticks onto the floor at his feet. Dave squatted down to collect them, while Graham turned over the box. A dragon, he said. Dave stood and looked at the image on the top of the box, seeing what Graham had already observed. There was no logo, no writing, just the drawing of a large green dragon with the horn on its nose, like a rhinoceros's. I don't know the brand, said Dave, but then when did I last buy matches? Foreign, I guess, Graham replied. Souvenir of some holiday. Dave returned the spilled matches to the box and placed it on the mantelpiece. Graham considered the concept of Ben going on holiday, sitting on a distant beach somewhere in his stripy trousers and tank top. It didn't fit the man he'd known in recent years, but the matchbox appeared older than that. The Ben that Graham had known as his grandparents' neighbour might have taken holidays. The same two weeks in August, the same little seaside town. Abroad? It seemed unlikely. 
the south coast, Cornwall, maybe the Silly Isles at a push, rubbing shoulders with Mr. and Mrs. Wilson. Ben was not an adventurer. Graham looked over to the window. That was a huge assumption. He could not pretend to know Ben from so little acquaintance. Two separate acquaintances in reality, and two separate men. The button-down businessman who had lived next door to Graham's grandparents, and the dishevelled old man who wandered up and down the road or sat in the park at the end of it, muttering to himself and occasionally shouting at passers-by. For Graham, there had been a 30-year gap between those two Bens. His grandparents had moved out to Surrey in the mid-70s, and so Graham's visits had been to a much larger house where he and his brothers could roam freely in the gardens. But they hadn't sold the house in London, renting it out instead. When they died around the turn of the millennium and their estate was divided up, it had seemed far easier for Graham and his family to return to the house of his childhood memories and to sell it. And so a new generation of McKees had moved in. He'd only had vague memories of Ben. He certainly hadn't remembered his name. It was Dave who reminded him, though he'd only heard it second hand. For Graham, it didn't quite fit with his memories, but he couldn't make out why. And anyway, back then a little boy wouldn't have addressed an unrelated adult by his Christian name. It would have been Mr. and then whatever the surname was. It was too late to find out now. Graham should have found out and should have addressed Ben properly. It would have returned a little of the dignity that time had taken away. Hey, hey, look at this lot. Dave's voice broke Graham's reverie. He was quite a hoarder. Really? As Graham looked, he saw Dave peering into a glass-fronted cabinet beside the door. Graham went over. There was a sense of something special about the diverse collection of objects inside the cabinet. It wasn't cluttered, underfilled if anything, as if the purpose of the cabinet was to show off the items, rather than the items having been purchased to fill the cabinet. And yet, most of them were junk. On the top shelf, a rectangular gap in the dust revealed where an object had recently been removed, undoubtedly the matchbox that Ben had been clutching as he died. His favourite of them all, perhaps? Graham reached into the cabinet, but felt Dave's hand on his arm. Should we? Dave asked. He wanted people to see these things, wanted to show them off, wanted people to ask about them too, Graham thought, and ask about the stories behind them. There were stories, to be sure. No one would bring together such an unrelated collection of bric-a-brac for its aesthetic value. Each piece must have had a reason beyond itself for being there. But Graham had never been into this room before, never looked, never asked. And now it's too late. At least he could show an interest. His hand fell upon an object at random. It was made of glass with a slight tinge of green to it, fashioned with little precision. Bottle stopper, he suggested. Dave nodded. But where's the bottle? Broken? Graham shrugged. It seemed unlikely. Everything in this cabinet was precious. Ben would have handled any bottle with care. If someone else had broken it, Ben would have repaired it. If there was no bottle, Graham guessed, then there had never been a bottle, not in Ben's possession. He put the stopper back exactly as he found it. Next he brought out a badge, a six-pointed star. For a moment, Graham thought of Nazi Germany. Ben, Benjamin, if that's what it had been short for, was a Jewish name. But old though he was, could he have been caught up in that? A relative, perhaps? He turned the badge over and chuckled to himself. Sheriff. The single capitalised word with a few hints of decoration around it explained what the badge really signified. The six little circles rounding off each of the points of the star should have told him. It was just part of a dressing up costume. Even so, it was well made. Solid brass, not like the plastic junk you'd get today. It must have been from Ben's childhood in, what, the 30s? They made toys properly back then, but this was still something special. Mi tonto, Kimosabe. Dave was holding up a tomahawk, another item from the cabinets, as if about to strike. Let's have a look, said Graham. They swapped items. The axe was primitive, like something from the Stone Age, just a conveniently shaped rock lashed to a stick with twine. It wasn't even sharp. It could have been fashioned a millennia ago by a caveman, or centuries ago by an American Indian or recently by a man finding a stick and a rock on a beach, perhaps Ben on that beach in the Scilly Isles. Some of the objects were less interesting, a seashell, a small whistle, a lump of greenish rock. But even though they were commonplace in themselves, the very fact they had been set out on display gave them a value beyond what was intrinsic to them. By being displayed, they became art. Would Ben have smiled at the idea that he'd become a conceptual artist? Some of the things they found were just plain weird. There was a clown's nose. Dave put it on. It suited him. Red nose day, he suggested. Graham tried to picture Ben sitting in a bath of baked beans, dressed in his green tank top and striped tie. The image changed, and he saw Ben as he was now, still up to his chest in the orange goo, but his face withered and decayed. Neither vision was appropriate. Ben was a charitable man, Graham felt sure of it, but he would give without ostentation. He was surprised how well he felt he knew the old man. 
how he could feel so certain of his nature on so little evidence. This is a cut above the rest, he said, examining a marble urn. Must have been hell to carve. It was cut from a single piece of stone, whose colour varied from a ruby red through brown to an exquisite green. The paper label, decorated with stars and peeling off the side, seemed to spoil its beauty, but Graham was not going to rip it off if Ben had chosen to keep it. He took off the lid and looked inside. It was empty. He blew into it and a cloud formed from the sprinkling of black dust that remained within, momentarily enveloping his face. Suddenly Graham felt the sensation that he was immensely tall, taller even than the house itself, but still inside it, staring down at the room with Ben in his chair and Dave squatting beside the cabinet. It passed in a moment, and Graham realised that he was still kneeling on the carpet beside his neighbour. He wondered if perhaps the jar contained all that was left of Ben's stash of some exotic drug. For all his ideas about the old man being straight-laced, he'd been young once, and had been round in the sixties. It didn't seem impossible. Careful, smoke, Dave. That's all that's left of Auntie Jean. Graham put the urn down quickly. That was a more likely explanation. Perhaps we could use it for him. Dave tilted his head towards the corpse, just feet away from them. When the time comes. Graham nodded slowly. It was a thought. He looked again into the cabinet. Like the sheriff's badge and the tomahawk, he found two more objects that seemed in some sense paired. A winner and a loser, he said. Dave looked and Graham showed him what he had picked up. For the winner, there was a medal, suspended from a blue triangle of material. For a moment he wondered if it might be a military award, but the large figure one on the gold face indicated it was a first prize for something. The image behind the number was of a hot air balloon. Again, it was hard to picture Ben entering, let alone winning a balloon race, but here was the evidence. The loser's prize was traditional, a wooden spoon. There was nothing special about it, nothing to suggest what it had been the booby prize for. Perhaps Ben had not been so lucky or so skilled in another of his balloon races. Perhaps the spoon was just what it appeared to be, a kitchen implement. Beautiful plumage! Dave's words introduced his next find. A single feather coloured with stripes of red, yellow and blue like the flag of Romania. Graham was reminded of the parrots on the television when they'd arrived. And then there was only one item remaining, a photograph. Seven elephants huddled together as if all trying to squeeze into the frame, as if they understood that they were being photographed. The plants in the background suggested the wilds of the jungle rather than a zoo. Ben's travels had taken him further afield than Graham had guessed. That's it then, he announced. Not quite, said Dave. This was behind the photo. He was holding a piece of black cloth, folded up small enough to fit into his hand. Is there something inside it? Dave moved his hand up and down to judge the weight. Nothing very substantial. He unfolded it once, twice, and then a third time. No contents were revealed, but it became clear that the material was not pure black. There was some sort of decoration, pieces of white cloth stitched onto the black background. Dave placed it on the carpet and continued to unfold it. It was only when the full image was revealed that Graham guessed what they were looking at. This is Jolly Roger. The black eyes of the skull gazed up at them, reminding Graham of Ben's empty eye sockets staring and seeing at the television. The skull leered with a grin that conveyed no happiness. It was more a bearing of teeth. Beneath its two long crossbones made the nature of the flag clear. Looks like he was just a big kid at heart, said Dave. Graham nodded but had his doubts. Like the sheriff's badge and the medal, even the tomahawk, this was too well made to be a mere toy. It had eyelets sewn in to attach it to a rope. Each of the items they'd found in the cabinet might have had a childlike appeal to it, but they were constructed for an adult world. They were the things as found in the child's imagination, not the disappointing replicas bought from a toy shop. They folded the flag up as close as they could remember to how they had found it, and returned it to the cabinet. Graham stood up and looked at his watch. Won't be long now, said Dave. He wandered across the room, past Ben's lifeless body and towards the fireplace. He kept his eyes fixed on the floor so that he never had to see much of the old man, but could at least see his slippered feet and thereby avoid any risk of collision. He stood with his back to both Ben and Graham, his hands clasped behind him, inspecting the picture above the mantelpiece with affected interest. Graham joined him. There wasn't much to it, a print of a landscape by some deservedly unknown artist. The main feature, a windmill, was the closest connection it had to the Dutch masters. A donkey stood in the foreground, or it might have been a cow. Dave let out a brief, exasperated laugh, followed by a pause and then a chuckle. It was you who told me it was called Ben, wasn't it? He said. No, Graham was guarded. I agreed with you that it was called Ben when you told me. But you said you knew him way back. I did, but I wouldn't have remembered his name if you hadn't said anything. It sounded right, but... But, 
you know, it didn't quite gel. Dave laughed again. He handed Graham what he was holding. It was behind the clock, he explained. It was a white envelope. In the top left-hand corner, the letters of the logo were familiar, white on blue, NHS. Should we be reading this? Graham asked. Just look at the address. Graham looked through the plastic window and laughed, the same laugh he had heard from Dave moments before. He read what he saw again. Mr. Ben, 52 Festive Road, London, SW15, 1LP. I don't suppose there's any chance he was called Ben Ben. Graham shook his head slowly. How do we get it wrong like that? Chinese whispers suggested Dave. It was the people we bought the house off told me. Someone else told them. I must have got to him. Graham remembered that strange look in the old man's eyes whenever he'd been addressed as Ben. A man like that, the least he can expect is the dignity of people knowing his name. Poor old sob, said Dave, looking towards the body. The walls flickered blue as the ambulance pulled up outside. 7 weeks earlier Mr Ben was sitting in his armchair. He was watching the Eden Channel. He loved to watch cable TV. So many different worlds they could enter into as easy as pressing a button. He didn't even have to go out of the house and walk down to that wasn't an option anymore and hadn't been for a long time not since they'd redeveloped that whole little lane of shops. Some of them like the ones selling overpriced antique furniture had been able to afford to relocate to Chelsea but the one Mr Ben used to frequent had simply vanished. But Mr Ben couldn't regret it was better to have loved and lost. The programme on the television was an intimate study of the lifestyle of the Komodo dragon. Mr Ben smiled to himself. He had never been to Indonesia, never been outside the British Isles except for one brief trip to Calais, God knew how long ago, and yet he had visited the whole world. He had swum beneath the waves, had cooked for a princess, and had walked on the surface of distant planets. He had met a real fire-breathing dragon and talked to it and become its friend. He stood up, hearing the sound of his creaking knees, and shuffled slowly over to the cabinet near the door. He took out the box of matches, the first and favourite of all his souvenirs, and returned to his chair. He looked at the picture of the dragon, holding the box close to his eyes so that he could see. The dragon looked happy, so different from the first time Mr Ben had encountered the creature. Was it still happy now? Mr Ben wondered. It was a meaningless question. And whenever it was they had met, it was centuries before. How long did dragons live? He smiled and let his hand, still holding the box, fall back on the arm of the chair. They were questions Mr Ben had considered over and over again, never arriving at any satisfactory conclusion. Then Mr Ben realised he was no longer alone. Almost as if by magic, a man had appeared in the room, standing beside him. Mr Ben stood up and looked at him. He was familiar, but Mr Ben couldn't place him. His thick glasses and toothbrush moustache might almost have been a disguise. Just beside him, next to the fireplace, stood a door that Mr Ben could not recall being there before, not in all the years he had lived here. The man held out his arm, indicating the door was there for Mr Ben to use. Mr Ben was happy to oblige, but he did not move. He wanted things to be right, wanted them to fit the formula. Would you step this way, sir? said the little man. Mr Ben smiled. He reached out and opened the door, then walked through. He turned back towards the room and took one last look at himself, dressed in his suit and green tank top, seated in his favourite armchair, his dead eyes pointing blankly towards the flickering images on the television. Then he closed the door. The room seemed crowded now, with the arrival of two police officers and two paramedics, though they had quickly confirmed that Mr Ben was beyond the reach of their skills. David had already left. Graham could see him hovering nervously on the pavement outside. It was time to go. He glanced at the body in the chair, but there was no need to attempt any form of goodbye. This was not Ben nor Mr Ben. It was merely flesh, and wouldn't be that for much longer. He put the box of matches back in the cabinet, aligning it precisely with the gap in the dust that marked its position, then headed for the hallway. At the door he stopped, noticing what was hanging from the hook on the back. In all their exploration, he and Dave had not remarked upon it. He picked it up and then realised that the constable was watching him. He smiled apologetically, but the policeman merely shrugged. Graham left with his booty. On the street, Dave was glad to see him. Pub, I think, was his greeting. Then he saw what Graham was holding. What's that? What do you think it is? Graham held it out for both men to look at. His bowler hat. Young or old, Graham could never recall seeing Mr Ben walking down the road without it. You're not thinking of wearing it, are you? asked Dave. Graham shook his head. Why then? Graham rubbed the material of the rim between his thumb and forefinger. I thought I'd keep it. 
Dave raised a questioning eyebrow. You know, Graham explained. Just to help me remember. Thank <laughs> you.